You can start when you're ready. Okay. Welcome everybody. And uh, I'm happy that you're here to meet Mary Shelley. Uh, she is so famous because of when she was 18 years old, she wrote the most famous Gothic horror story of all time. Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, I'm sure all of you have heard of it. And maybe you've seen one of the films because there have been 69 films made that are built from this particular book. Because of course, the most famous one is the one with Boris Karloff, which was in 1931. And it was directed by James Whale and produced by Universal Pictures. Now, just recently, just in September, the original script, the original book of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which is actually uh, three volumes, was, was uh, Christie's, um, what do you call it? They, they uh, auctioned it off and it broke the record for any book that ever written by a woman that ever was uh, bought. The one be pr prior to that was Jane Austen's Emma, which was actually uh, auctioned off for $205,000. But Frankenstein by Mary Shelley went for $1.17 million. And it was all the headlines. It was just in September this year. Um, now, the, there is one movie which I've not seen of Mary Shelley, which was a, an international production uh, that uh, premiered in 2017 at the Toronto International Festival. Um, it looks like a wonderful film, and uh, we'll check it out when we can. Okay, meanwhile, introduction to Frankenstein. When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. <laughs> to shock women into uncontrolled hysteria. <laughs> upon the innocence of children. This is the story you heard about, talked about. The spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stunned your emotions. Frankenstein. Okay, how many people have seen that film or think they've seen the film because it's really a classic and you should see it again. Don't oh, stop. Okay, now I'm trying to go to the next one. Okay, now in this great drama of the film Frankenstein, which is true for the book, uh, the monster by Boris Karloff actually has a childish heart and he's looking for love. And when he doesn't get love, he becomes a, a killer. And this famous book was written by Mary Godwin in 1816 when she was just 18 years old on a dare. Now, what was her life before this that gave her such a deep understanding of science and the human heart? Let's start with her birth and her mother. Mary Wollstonecraft. This was Mary Shelley's mother, and she has 
always been hailed as the first feminist writer in history. She wrote about women's rights in the 1700s, but she died tragically 11 days after giving birth to Mary. Now she's a very interesting woman. Uh, she was uh, the daughter of a farmer and she went out and worked as a governess. And then she moved up to London and worked for a publisher. And she would help edit the books that came in and he started publishing her books. Her most famous book was about women's rights and it was a vindication of the rights of women and 1792, it was published and it made her a household name because she said women should be educated as men. Women should not be tied to, to, the, to the house and uh, women should have careers. I mean, she was absent. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, when there was a book published, the, the last time this book was published, Susan B. Anthony wrote the introduction because she was her inspiration. Now, she believed that the only way that the, the England could possibly be corrected from their unfairness, the rich and the poor being so far divided, the poverty in England was dreadful, uh, was, was through revolution. And so when the French Revolution happened in 1792, she took off and went to Paris. And while she was in Paris, uh, she had a love affair with um, a, an American diplomat who was there named, named Imlay, and she had a child by him, and she was going to stay there and celebrate these, this wonderful change in, in the world with the freedom of the, of the poor of the people. And then one day she's sitting at the window, and she was the, where she was was on the path leading to the tumbrils where they would execute the, the uh, royalty. And one of the tumbrils came by and there was Louis the 16th on the way to be guillotined. And all around him, she wrote about this, all around him was screaming people, file, calling him vile names, spitting on him. The mob was, was horrible. And he was so dignified that at that moment she said, revolution is not what I thought it would be. And she, and she went back to England with her little girl and, and she said, I'm going to try and, and, and help bring up people, uh, the, the rights of women in my own country. And she pretty much gave up uh, the ideas of revolution. Then she met all the young intellectuals that were in England at the time and leading them was the man who became Mary Shelley's father. His name was William Godwin. And he was her father. And at that time, he was England's leading political philosopher and a devout anarchist. So Mary grew up in a house where famous men came together to discuss literature, politics, and ideas. Some of the famous men, you'll know their names. And Mary was a little girl meeting these men. Thomas Paine was one of the guests. William Blake, the poet. William Wordsworth, the poet. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the writer. And Aaron Burr, the former vice president of the United States. These are just some of the people who used to come there and discuss ideas. And her father, uh, William Godwin, he had been raised a Calvinist and wanted to become a minister. But after he became a minister, he moved to New York. He moved to London because he was very uh, strong politically. He believed that, uh, that we have to overthrow all the political, social, and religious institutions that are oppressing people. But he didn't believe in, in, in a revolution being violent. He believed in reason. And he, like Bertrand Russell, one of my idols, and he believed that calm discussion could carry every change. And he held that belief all his life in spite of the fact that uh, nobody wanted to listen <laughs> as we see today. Well, Mary Wollstonecraft was, uh, she worked for the publisher of his books and that's how he met her. And they fell in love and, they, and because when she got pregnant, in order to keep the child from being illegitimate, which in England at that time was considered shameful, 
uh, they married, even though they were both opposed to marriage, they both believed in free love. Um, and they lived next door to each other. They both had their own homes uh, and they had her little girl, uh, uh, her little girl from her first marriage was Fanny. She was now three years old and then uh, Mary was pregnant. And when Mary gave birth, uh, the, the tragedy happened where she died of peripheral fever and he was left with two little children. Uh, he adored the, the kids and he tried his best to be father and mother to them. But finally, after about three years, when Mary was three, uh, he realized he had to marry. He had to have uh, needed a, a mother in the house. And he, he approached a number of very famous women, uh, po politicians and, and writers, and they all saw that, oh, oh, no, no, I'm not going back into the house. And he ended up marrying a neighbor. Her name uh, was, uh, wait, Cl Mary Clay Clay right, Claremont, right, Claremont. And she had two children and they moved into his house. And he and, he and uh, his wife, uh, they opened a bookstore and they, they had a very harmonious marriage, but they were very poor. And Mary uh, found that she did not like the stepmother, her stepmother favored her own children over, over his children. And when Mary was about 13 years old, she became very ill. And so her father sent her to live with one of the great, another great philosopher up in Scotland. And she was very, she was very happy uh, in, in the wilds of Scotland. Now, as a child, Mary loved books and she would often visit her mother's grave at St. Pan Pancras Cemetery nearby and sit and read. She would also daydream over what might have been if this great woman who gave her life had lived. This haunted her for her entire life, of course, and, uh, even, uh, and her father, to trying to make up for that, he, he doted on her, he, he encouraged her reading, he encouraged her writing, and... Uh, and uh, when, when she went away to Scotland, uh, he, he approved that, you know, she would, she would have peace of mind because he knew she didn't get along with, the, with her stepmother. And uh, after uh, she, uh, after she came back home, uh, one of the visitors that he was, he was uh, having coming to the house was this young fellow named Percy Bysshe Shelley. Now, Percy Bysshe Shelley, he was an aristocrat. His father was Sir Timothy Shelley, who was a very uh, stubborn um, autocratic man who was embarrassed by this crazy son that he had because he was expelled from Oxford after he wrote and distributed an essay that was titled The Necessity of Atheism. He was a passionate man about ideas, about art, about beauty, and he would uh, dominate every conversation he was in. And he took that pamphlet and he sent it to the heads of all the colleges and to all the bishops in London. And so they threw him out. That was not, not a good idea. Uh, he, he got married and he had children and he came to visit Godwin because Godwin was the great philosopher. And then he kept coming back to meet secretly with his daughter, 16 year old Mary. That's him. Oh, so one, one of the poems that, uh, that Shelley, uh, with, uh, is very famous for is called Love is Philosophy. Uh, Shelley believed in free love. Uh, he believed that women were equal to men. Uh, he had very strong ideas and he expounded them everywhere he went. And uh, this, is, this is the song, this is Love's Philosophy, the music put, put, put to music by my husband, Ralph Martell. And the picture is of Shelley and Byron uh, from, from our show, our off-Broadway show, Shelley. Because Byron also believed in free love.
Oh, it does it again. Stop. Okay. Now, into this story comes Lord George Gordon Byron. He is the, was the most famous poet and he had many scandalous affairs that shocked England. He supposedly fathered a child with his half sister, Augusta Lee, and he had numerous affairs, including with Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont. Now, George Byron was actually named after a descendant of James I, who was his grandfather. And at age 10, he became the sixth Baron of Nottinghamshire. His mother adored him. His father was, was, a, was a crazy guy who never came home and, and was always drunk. And his mother adored him and spoiled him. And she, but she was very moody and she drank. And so uh, they, had, they had a real love-hate relationship, but it was more love than hate, I think. Uh, when he went off to Harrow, which is like prep school, uh, he skipped his studies. He couldn't bear to study, but he was very good at cricket. And he started having affairs with the boys. In 1812, when he was 21, he wrote, he was a very prolific writer and he wrote Child Harold's Pilgrimage. And it was a memoir about his own, his own journeys because he loved to travel. And it was published and quote, he always said, and this is a direct quote from Byron, I awoke one morning and found myself famous. Well, he was famous and all the women in, in London wanted to have sex with him. And, and Lady Carolyn Lamb, uh, said she had not she was not interested but when she met him she changed her mind and they had a very tempestuous affair where she used to threaten to kill him and she called him this very famous mad bad and dangerous to know anyway he actually did uh, uh have an affair with with uh uh mary's stepsister and that is part of the story of the ghost the night of the ghost stories now Mary was 16 and Shelley was 21. He used to, he used to join her in the, in the uh, cemetery with her mother and they were in love with words and life and each other. And after a very brief courtship, they ran off together to the continent along with her stepsister, Claire. Now, Mary uh, was, only 16, but they had, they did have sex because she became pregnant and her father was very, was very distressed about this whole thing with her and Shelley. And uh, if it was the only reason that he uh, did not totally disown her was because Shelley was helping support him because the, the bookstore wasn't doing too well, but uh, they, the, uh, the two of them went off to the continent and with Claire, they traveled around for about a year or two. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Shelley became friendly with Byron and he, uh, he was, would go visit him and Byron was very ha uh, happy to have company. They, they were very sociable in those days. And so they ended up staying, oh, here was Claire. Claire, she had an ongoing affair with Byron after she met him through Mary and Shelley, and she gave birth to a little girl. But to her dismay, he took the child and he put her in a convent, and the little girl died there from, from uh, of typhoid, typhus at about six years old. Uh, so after that, Claire hated him. Um, this is Lord Byron's study and it was on, on his, his, uh, coast, his coastal mansion. And he invited Mary, uh, Mary, Shelley and Mary to come there. And they, they were staying there for a, couple, for a week or two with Claire. And the weather was terrible. So they were stuck inside the house. And they were complaining because they said, we came here to go boating and to look at the ocean. Uh, and so they said, OK, let's, 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 all, let's all write a ghost story. We, we, you know, we can all, we're all good writers, so we'll write a ghost story. So they started and Mary couldn't think of anything. And then Byron and Shelley got bored and they went off fishing and they said, this is boring. And, and Claire uh, went off and, to read a book and Mary was all by herself. And she went, to, she went to bed and she said she had a waking dream. 
And she said in the dream, she saw this creature that was, that was made of pieces of a man and something brought it to life. And she woke up in horror, but she said, I, I don't think I was even sleeping, but the whole idea came to her and she, and she wrote the story and she read it to them and everybody said, this is great. And so uh, by uh, Shelley, he said to her, come on, we're gonna have it published. And he, what, he helped work with her to develop the story further, to, to make it a full length book. And when it was published, it was an immediate hit. So it's always been a very successful a book and a movie. Now, meanwhile, Harriet Westbrook Shelley was Shelley's first wife. And she, when he left with Mary, she, she was left with two children and she had to fend for herself. And then two years later, pregnant and abandoned, she drowned herself. Now, Harriet was 16 years old and she was in school with Shelley's sister. And this was how he met her. She was considered one of the greatest beauties in, 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 in London. And he persuaded her to run away with him. So he kind of had a habit of, of, of romancing 16 year olds. And he told her about free love and, and how wonderful it could be. And so they got married. And, uh, and, and after a while, he went off with some other young woman uh, that he was writing. Because a lot of his poems, if you look at his poetry, one is, to, one is to Harriet, one is to Mary, one is to Jane, and one is to a lot of other young women. So he was, a, he was his free love was <laughs> very free. But anyway, Harriet, it, to me, was a tragic figure because uh, her, her own family wouldn't help her. Uh, Sir Timothy, Shelley's father, wouldn't help her. And she, had, she believed in free love and she had a love affair and the guy left her. And she was pregnant in London with no, no support. And the only thing one could, a woman could do in those days was kill herself. So she went to the Serpentine River and drowned herself. This is, in our show, this was Harriet's uh, lament that what, what was done to her with, with, with her love for Shelley. And this is Janine Jean, Taylor who played the part, wonderful actress. Sorry. <laughs> okay, but so after Harriet's death, Mary and Shelley were married and they went to live in Italy on the Mediterranean coast. They had two terrible losses, their little infant daughter, Clara, and their three-year-old son, William, both died. They think it was typhus or pneumonia, but this started a 
a pattern in their life that Mary could never shake off her depression. Uh, they, had, they had many friends and Claire was there and everybody complained that Mary was, was always depressed and, and Shelley wrote a poem. Uh, uh, we, did, we, were not, we had it set to music and I can only quote it for you because uh, this, this, it was, his poem was to Mary and he said, my dearest Mary, wherefore hast thou gone and left me in this dreary world alone? Thy form is here, at least a lovely one, but thou art fled, gone down that dreary road that leads to sorrow's most obscure abode. Thou sittest on the hearth of pale despair and where I cannot follow thee. The world is weary and I am weary of wandering on without you, Mary. Thy voice was erstwhile in thy voice and thy smile, but it is gone and I must be gone too, Mary. And she could not shake the depression until she got pregnant again. And then they had another little boy and life seemed to settle down. Then after these years of grief, they had the little boy and it looked like things were gonna be all right. And then one day he sailed off to visit Byron, who lived further along the coast. His boat was caught in a sudden storm and he and his two companions were drowned. And Mary was left there with her little child. Shelley's body was washed ashore two weeks later and his body was burned on the shore. This is a very famous painting of the, of the event. Uh, uh, Byron said, he must be cremated like a Greek hero and we will build a funeral pyre on the beach. And when Shelley's body was found, they weren't even sure it was his except because it was washed ashore about two weeks after the loss. But in his, in his back pocket was a, was a book of poems by John Keats, who was another great romantic poet that they all, they all have done. Oh my God, could you get rid of it? Sorry, the phone was ringing. <laughs> I thought I turned it off. Okay, so um, when bar they burned his body on, on the shore and the, uh, the, when it was burned to ashes, somehow his heart was still there. And so one of his friends, he snatched it up and he brought it to Mary and she kept Shelley's heart in her desk for the rest of her life. Now, Mary, was left alone with, uh, with a son. Uh, she went to Sir Timothy Shelley, who is, was, the, was the grandfather, and he refused to help her. He said, I will only give you money if you, if you do not tell anyone about my son's life or his work or anything. And so in order to survive, she said, oh, okay. So then she found very sneaky ways of, of putting out uh, her, her husband's poems, uh, his poetry, his, uh, she didn't need to do a biography because his friends were writing biographies, but she was determined that people would recognize that he was one of the great poets. And uh, she, she um, uh, 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 was uh, living in London and she, and she had to make a living. So she started writing novels she worked for newspapers, writing articles. Uh, she, she still uh, knew all the famous people who used to come to her father's house. Uh, many of them wanted to marry her. And uh, she said to one who was, uh, they were famous writers, they were famous uh, actors. She said, no, I have, I have lived with a genius and I do not want to ever live with any anymore. <laughs> and uh, she, the one thing that, had happened to her, which I think was motivating her, was before he died, she had written in her diary, and I've been looking at her diary, because people kept journals in those days, fantastic. And she had written in her diary that if she, I could only be happy if the last five years were erased from my life. And shortly after that, he drowned. And I think it was, it was like, I, I owe him to, to keep him alive to make sure that he is not lost. And because there was a great love between them, but the tragedies overwhelmed it. And so that is why 
She spent the rest of her life writing and bringing his work to the attention of the public. And because of this, he is now recognized as one of the greatest of the romantic poets. Ode to the West Wind is my favorite poem of his. And in this video, this is again from our show that was done off Broadway. It's sung by British actor, Keith Benedict, a brilliant, brilliant actor, singer, who starred as Shelley in our hit musical. You've seen photos of him in, in the tapes. And it ran seven months off Broadway in New York in the 1980s. The book was by myself as Mona Murphy. The music was composed by Ralph Martell and the lyrics are by Percy Bysshe Shelley. And this is Ode to the West Wind. For a while, West Wind, Morton's Beat, our homes unseen presence, the leaves in a dreadful and unsubstantial dream, yellow and black and pale and empty red, pestilence-stricken mountain. Why is it doing this? Okay, it's doing it again. Anyway. Sorry, <laughs> it won't stop. <laughs> Shelly won't let it stop. <laughs> okay, Mary and Shelly, they are together forever in life and poetry. He is so well, 
famous, famous for his poetry, Soul Meets Soul on Lover's Lips. And Mary, so famous for her, for her writing of her book and her, her words from Frankenstein, if I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. And there they are, two greats. And I hope you enjoyed hearing about them today. And thank you for being here. Okay. Get out. <laughs> Hi, Morna. Morna? Who is that? 